My name is Liz Fraley and I'll be your host today. This morning we're lucky enough to have Jonas Hetner from Simonsoft with us. He's going to talk about the value of XML in the managing data sets and in single source environment. Before we get started, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind everyone about all the resources available to the ArborText community. Ours is a large and very tight-knit community. Over the years, as things have changed, and particularly after the PTC acquisition, we found a lot of people didn't know all the resources available to them as ArborText users. I've got a chart here. It's from the list maintained by Single Sourcing Solutions. The URL is at the bottom of the page, so you can just click on them and go to whichever thing you're interested in. It's as near as complete a list as we've got. All of these are free resources, and most are online. Uh, there's a mailing list. There's two. Adapters has been around since 1997. Arbor Text R&D and Project Management monitor and answer questions on the list. Uh, the 3BT user group has been around since the early 2000s at least. Uh, there's an Adapters Code Archive, which is a repository of customization code snippets and useful things. The user group, that's us here today. There's an advisory line for quick answers when you don't have time to wait. Uh, in the next row, there's ArborText community members are starting to have blog about their experiences. There's words in boxes and structured authoring. Uh, the single sourcing blog has the top ArborText resources page, and it's a short list of seven or eight resources you absolutely must know if you're an ArborText user. Um, it's got a Kindle edition and can be delivered in email, and as we all know, those are just other formats if you're an ArborText user. Uh, especially. The PubWrite podcast, is uh, these are folks you meet on the mailing list or talk to or meet at conferences with deep experience in the industry. The idea is to get the tribal information out of their heads and into yours. Search for Arbortext on iTunes or go to the URL. Uh, the Monster Garage is where all these community members are gathering to show what you can do if you have Arbortext in your tool chest. Uh, last, next row, we're on Facebook. This user group has a Facebook page. There's also one dedicated to APP3B2. There's a lot of people on Twitter who are ArborText users. Um, there's even a group Twitter account that one of our community members maintains, and uh, he'll retweet ArborText jo job postings and other things that come across his stream. Um, we're on LinkedIn. There's a, a blog at Dita XML where ArborText and Dita intersect. Uh, there are lots and lots of more resources coming from PTC every day. There's the PTC communities. There's a PTC World Conference. These happen worldwide and places around the globe. And they're sponsoring a YouTube channel and just launched a training channel, which is really um, interesting and, and good to see from them. Um, there's PTC User. That's the group we're a part of. There are customer-driven technical committees, and everyone is encouraged to participate because PTC wants to know where the product should go and how it, and want you to help guide product development and direction of the products at PTC. Uh, there's a Flickr feed. Get pictures of the people you're talking to and listening to here on, in this event and everywhere else. And there's a Squidoo lens. All things are protected in one spot. That's kind of what Squidoo is all about. Again, if you want to see the full list and just be able to click on the links, go to the URL at the bottom, and uh, that's pretty much the, the way this goes. There's all kinds of things here ready for us. Uh, really quick, one last thing, upcoming events. April 15th, the Monster Garage is doing the explanation of custom directories in ArborText. Uh, I don't, we don't know yet what our April user meeting is going to be, uh, so keep an eye out and let us, and uh, as we find out, you'll, you'll know too. Uh, Monster Garage at the end of April is, uh, if you want to start doing customization in ArborText command language, this is the place to start. In May, APP World is coming up. This is in London. And then there's a uh, Monster Garage in May, which is uh, basic authoring automation using ACL. So this is how this is where we're going, and the schedule is online uh, there at the URL at the bottom of the stage. Today's presentation is Managing Technical Data Sets Using XML by Jonas Hardner. Uh, Jonas is a technical expert at Simonsoft. Simonsoft is a company who distributes Arbortext product portfolio to the complete Nordic market. Working with many experienced publishing companies in the Nordic region, they provide these solutions directly to the end user. It's for very specific cases. Jonas is working on an Arbortext conference in the Nordic region. Arbortext users will be able to get together and talk shop. Sounds great. Wish I were there. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Jonas. Jonas, it's all yours. Here we go. Here we go. Can you, can you hear me? All right. Yes, we can. So Liz, I'm Swedish. I'll speak slightly slower than you, just slightly. <laughs> um, so thanks, thanks, Liz. Um, I'll, I'll um, hang on. Uh, are you guys now seeing uh, Liz? Are you now seeing the the, um, the go to 
webinar thing on my screen. Can I should I? Yes, we are. Yeah, I'll try to hide it down somewhere down here. All right. So I'll be talking about uh, technical data sets, and I'll, I'll shortly explain what what that means and and uh, what that is. Um, Liz, you um, so basically, I'll, I'll talk first about the business problem. I'll give you a customer example from uh, one of our customers where we're currently implementing this. A little bit about the solution and the future plans, and then then uh, hand over to a uh, Q and A session, uh, basically. Um, yeah, you gave a, a very nice presentation of us. I won't won't do much more than you. I think we're a similar company as to uh, signal sourcing. We we are a reseller for for Arbitex since five years. Um, we also we stole some resources from Arbitex when when uh, PTC acquired the company, and and uh, some of us come from PTC as well. And then we formed this company uh, about five years ago. Um, we do a little bit of our own product development. We develop a um, subversion. Um, based content management system for uh, small medium ent enterprises based on on subversion and integrating with with Arbitext. and we do some of our own translation management stuff um, and we're also have a part of a larger group that does a bit of pro engineer and windshield uh, for, for PPC but we're an independent company uh, when it comes to the the CAD and, and PLM solution and we, and we do focus on small to medium businesses so so um, Really, anywhere from from one to ten authors is our uh, traditional um, customer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's the business problem? Well, technical data, or or, or if you if you manufacture a product, um, there'll be a lot of technical data describing this product, and um, this technical data is always is is sits in a lot of different applications and systems and. Um, you know, in 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 Excel sheets and and wherever, and there's there's never really a, a single source of truth. At the same time, um, there's there's more and more regulatory demands to really ensure that if I say that 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 a uh, battery has uh, five hours of power, then that the brochures has to say the same thing as the technical documentation, which has the same same thing as the requirements or, or the specification in, in such a document. Um, and today this, this constitutes a bit of a problem for, for companies because there, there, there are many truths uh, out there. Um, I'm going to talk about a company called, um, hang on, some new things here for me, here we go. I'm going to talk today about a company called um, Electrolux Laundry System. What they do is they do um, um, laundry uh, equipment for let's say larger for buildings or for 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 um, um, washing companies or things like that so so not not domestic products really so slightly larger things but, but very similar to a, a, a regular washing machine um, and each product has a, a fairly big set of uh, documentation and and uh, technical documentation so in their case, you'll find that they have um, um, each each product has a, a data sheet um, attached to it, and we might even have two or three data sheets attached to it, depending on how complex data you want to deliver. So uh, um, this is just a typical how a data sheet for a washing machine looks, and and here's the technical data I'm talking about. All of this the, the, this data in here. Um, I think I have a, another. Yeah, the same thing gets posted also on web. So on the web, they have a little explanation about the products, and then they have some of the technical data. But if you want to dig, you know, dig deeper, you go into the the, the data sheet, uh, basically. So so yeah, what's the what's the problem then at Electrolux? So when we came there. By the way, this is my interpretation of the different roles in a company using uh, Microsoft Clip Art. Uh, it's, it's as good as it gets. Uh, I, I, I try to separate you know, the, the cool design guy from the marketing, being a woman, so I don't know. Um, anyway, we, we found that there were four main places where they were writing uh, and, and creating technical data. Uh, in design, when they designed the product, uh, the, the 
some of the you know width, height, some of those things were, were, were always entered and managed normally in their PLM system. Um, there was a woman down in lab called Christine who did uh, sort of reports on in Excel and she had quite extensive Excel sheets. They were enormous with, with, with data in them. Um, she was unfortunately the only one who had these uh, Excel sheets. Nobody else in the company knew what was in them. There was a tech doc department. There was, um, uh, I think, the three people in the technical documentation department. Um, they sometimes used Christine's Excel, but sometimes they just asked around what technical information to put in their user manuals, into their installation manuals. And finally, you had marketing who not only had, you know, InDesign and web to update uh, for brochures and, and, um, and web data sheets, they also had their own own little data sheet tool which had an access database in it where they could from this access database they could um, publish um, very simple simple um, data sheets to to go you know PDFs to put on on the web or, or to send out um, and, and very interestingly marketing pushed um, a lot on the on on you know they wanted to have better things all the time. They wanted to have, um, you know, you should have m more, um, be able to wash a higher weight in, in each machine and then the competitor increased their uh, measurements and then suddenly marketing just out of the blue decided that we'll go and, and increase a little bit here as well just to match what the competition did. Um, so there, there, was a, there was a huge discrepancy between what was in the lab reports in the technical documentation and then finally in the in the marketing uh, material. Now, I don't, I don't think that Electrolux saw this as, as a um, business critical problem in, in the sense that it was, um, uh, you know, that, that they were in danger of, of being sued or, or something like this. But uh, as a matter of fact, if they would have been a medical device company or somebody in, in that kind of industry, um, if there just would simply simply be a difference between the marketing material and the technical documentation material, they could well be sued, or they could well, you know, end up with problems with FDA having to stop the production of, of, of such a such a product. I also added like a little bit pieces of puzzle down here that that shows about the size of the of the amount of data that came some, as an input. So PLM was a very small, you know. The PLM system it stands for Product Lifecycle Management or Product Data Management. It has the ambition of, of storing a lot of data, but the effort to do so in such a system is so high that engineers normally don't don't take that time out to do it. So, the, so things like width and height is, is not something you would even consider storing uh, as a separate uh, data. Um, like I said, Christine's lab was very uh, lab report was very extensive and very big. Taking the documentation had in in also a lot of tables and, and things as as well as did did marketing. Um, so what was the proposed solution really? The, so what we proposed is basically we we try to get everyone to author the information in one place. Um, so, so the proposal was that we, we set up an XML repository using um, a, an XML uh, sheet or XML file to store all of this information. Um, and then anyone could go in and, and access and change the data in, in, in the right place. And from this, we would then reuse the, the, uh, the data into uh, the different uh, type of, of outputs. So um, if they would need a certain amount of data into the web, we would then, then basically go and pick it from this from this XML uh, repository. Same with brochures, data sheets, or, or technical documentation. And I think we realized um, that we couldn't always we couldn't always push into each and every single brochure, but at least we could give the company a browser or uh, where they could search and find the data that was in the XML repository and thereby making sure that when they wrote 
things in the brochure that then went on to InDesign. Um, it, it, it was the latest and it was the validated information um, for that technical data. So, so obviously the, the, the link breaks sometimes when you, when you start desktop working something in, in a, bro, in a um, InDesign document or, or something like that. But it was at least better that, that all people responsible for technical uh, information could um, update and, and enter the, the, the information into uh, the same place, basically. Um, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into. Um, I, um, for, for, for those of you uh, very technically interested, I could uh, run this over in the end of the session, um, exactly what technology we used and, and, and how we did it. Did it. So then, then if we talk about the tools, then um, so we're we're on the Arbitex user meeting. So yes, obviously the the technical documentation department used used Arbitex, and for Arbitex, um, th that's a fairly simple thing to do. But we now had to engage with a number of people who had no uh, authoring experience with XML, and and the share you know the, the share idea of having to learn an XML editor to some people is a bit of a problem. So we, we, we needed to come up with a way for, of, of authoring these sheets for them, for, for, for other than the technical uh, documentation department, um, in, in a clever way that was, that was very, I should say, where the user interface was appealing, where it was simple, and where they couldn't basically make any errors um, to it. So we proposed a few different ways and approaches to this. Um, one is that we actually uh, built a web editor. Um, another one would be to customize uh, a web. Um, a customized should be should be a web editor should be a a web based XML um, tool, or we just customize the the um, Arbotext editor or Epic. Um, to to make it look simpler and and to just remove some some uh, boxes from the screen, um, we proposed all of these three for this customer, uh, and they they decided to to go with a web based editor which was then then um, uh, customized so that it had uh, much less button clicks and and menus to choose from than than uh, than the normal situation. Um, we were sort of debating about whether it, it, but it was just mainly cost that that held us away from from creating a, a complete uh, web-based uh, customized uh, editing environment. So, so really, this was a bit of a, a, a challenge we had to overcome because otherwise, marketing and and uh, lab and uh, some of these other departments wouldn't have accepted to actually uh, start editing uh, data and, and, and changing it. We also had a, a big discussion on how who can change data and who can you know what should there be rights? Should there be versioning control? Should there be um, what level of, of of you know release workflows and things like that? Should should we have? Right now we're in a test phase of that. We're, we're kind of testing that everyone is allowed to make a change, and it's latest. That's basically the version that that's out there that that, that is validated. So we don't use any any revision control to this, um, and we'll see how that goes. If that if that gets out of hand, we might have to uh, include that. But we think that it's better to get people up and 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 start actually using the tool and start editing rather than, than um, uh, uh, rather than holding back just because they're unsure that, that it's it's the wrong data. Um, hang on, I'll show you so so here's a, here's an example from another place where we did this um, uh, where we did this web interface and, and as you see then we've made it very simple for them to edit. They can just click uh, a box and, and, and in some areas, and some areas have free text and things like that. So, so we can also control that, that um, to some elements, the, the right 
the type of data is used. Um, we can have drop down menus and things like that to say that okay, you can only pick a value from a list or from a from a, a database rather than, 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 than freely picking this. Um, one of the other problems I didn't mention that, but one of the other problems was that we that we encountered, and, and one of the, the driving forces behind this project was the translation. Um, Electrolux translates their, their books in about 28 languages today. So for them, every time a data changed in one document meant that they had to open up um, 28 uh, documents to, to make the change. Um, and, and this is the type of change that, that they were flooded with uh, taking the data changes. Just small ones, but they came all the time. Um, so, in, historically, they basically saved up on having, you know, they, they they did an update every three months or something like that, and then they just saved up all the all the requests for changes until then, and then 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 made them in, in all the languages. Um, and it was also a bit of a mess with the with the every time they had to recalculate for inch or or, or work with the um, work with the uh, metric system versus the inch system and, and, and things like that. Um, well, demo is a strong word, what I'm gonna, about to do, but I'm, I'm at least going to show you a bit like uh, how it looks uh, in, the, um, in the editor. Um, I assume that everyone on board knows, knows how the editor looks. I'm not going to go into that. Um, this is one of their installation manual. Uh, this was done. This is actually from our demo set when we uh, when we sold uh, Arbitex to them. So so this is this no longer looks exactly like this. Um, and if we basically scroll down to find some technical data, so this is how they used to enter it, right? So here's a here's a sort of little drawing with the with the measurements on the machine, and here's here's a table. And depending on what machine you have, you can see the, the width and height uh, of, of uh, all of these different things. So uh, we basically then um, built in a, a new menu uh, called Tech Data and uh, introduced what we call the Technical Data Browser. Oops, went back up here. Let's go back here. Oh, we can take this one. So um, it allows the user to. So so this is also about how we stored. Um, how we stored the data. It, they, they choose to store it on a product by product um, um, type and then through every product type we had the, the um, information downwards. So basically I think this is a washer um, and then I don't know which washer that 465H, yeah so that's the one. So the user then can, can, can browse through um, and find the technical data set that, that they're, that they're uh, looking for. They, they basically uh, put the cursor where they where they want to they want to be, and they, they hit the the amount and it inserts uh, this data ref here instead. Um, and and I I, you know, I could go on and, and, and change this if if I wanted to. But I think you get the picture. Um, and now this is an absolute reference to. To the to the technical data file rather than than refer than than a manually entered uh, entered text, um, and I can then also do things like if we look at the if we look at the attributes on that file, we can see that instead of, it should convert to inch with uh, one decimal, and then we do a recalculate so that then we could. I'm not doing that now, but in, in, in Electrolux, what happens is that the root tag of the document, whether the, the, the tag that decides which language code the document has, then automatically updates all these uh, reference, depending on if it's a US tag or a, a Swedish or, or whatever. So, so then, then it automatically recalculates to the, the right uh, value. Um, where was I? Uh, yes. Um, so more for the for the sort of geekier audience. Here's the here's how the DTD and and the 
um, the data looks in, in a raw XML format. So basically, it, it's, it's stored under um, product name, type name, and then um, each uh, function, if you will, then has a set of attributes that, that you fill it in as uh, you fill them in as, as, as uh, attributes. And the advantage of you, we could have used some some other technology, but the, really the advantage of this having attributes to modify rather than than uh, entities in in XML is that it it this is what helps us build the browser much simpler from case A to case B. And it, it also, you know, it's much easier to do the the um, you know, the, 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 the ACL code and everything. So it's much faster for us to do it this way. Um, and then um, here we are. Mm. So I'm not I'm not so sure that there's so much more to tell. Um, we. Um, we spent uh, most of the time in this project was 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 actually spent on on trying to assemble all the data from all the different sources. Um, I think we have spent some five or ten days all in all in this in this project. Um, there might be some more if we're going to go uh, do a little more export functions from from XML to the to the web and, and things like that. We haven't done that yet. Um, we're also Looking now at, at some higher degree of customization to the to the uh, for the other people's uh, browsers, um, and and really there is no there is no software or, or anything in this that that isn't uh, standard uh, Arbitext. Um, so it's it's just to be a bit of a, a specialized DTD plus a, a um, some ACL coding that allows us to to pick up the values uh, in this one. Um, yeah, and then we think that we now have, I think we have three companies who have already started projects in this, and I think we're seeing that this is something where we're more or less going to have every manufacturing uh, uh, company uh, will will have some of this, even if it's just small part which which uses the XML sheet in um, for the technical documentation. We are now implementing that with all new customers, more or less. Um, but we see this as a as a very growing demand out there. Actually. I think that was all for me on a Saturday morning. Um, <laughs> that was great. Thank questions? you. We have was three. It, was it clear? It was. You did a great job. Thank you. We've got three questions, and while everybody else wants to type their questions into the question window, I'll ask the ones that have shown up in the meantime. We had one question. It was, what is the optimum cost-effective way to create XML using FrameMaker? Which version? Is FrameMaker 8 or 9 stable enough? Is 7.2 adequate? SDL, XML Spy for limited budgets? Uh, interesting question. Is somebody asking that in an Arbitext user meeting? And Arbitext was not one of the... <laughs> and Arbitext was not one of the... Well, so to your best experience, because you've been around in the industry, you've seen all kinds of things from all kinds of products. We, we, we think best that idea. we think that Arbitext, Arbitext presents the best authoring interface for somebody writing text. You know, if you want to do uh, data XML, XML Spy, or 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 there there are some others out there that 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 you would use for that. But when it comes to actual authoring, uh, I think that that's Arbitext editor is is uh, unbeatable. On the website, on the um, zero footprint um, for website, we think that um, we're very fond of oxygen, and that's that's actually what we're using in this case as well as the as the uh, web-based tool for for XML authoring. Um, Great. But, but yeah. All right. Here's a question. Another one. How can a small company or loan writer use XML to single source? Yeah, well, the problem is that it, it's very attractive to go and look for open source projects um, and say that you know that the software is free or it's a hundred dollars or, or or whatever. 
Um, in effect, there is a lot of open source projects for XML that you can go to and, 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 and just download the software and start authoring. The problem with that is not the, the actual software itself that it can't do what it should, is that it's not particularly user friendly. Um, I, I, I've seen, you know, seen, seen many of these tools and I've, I've met with customers who come to us and said, right, we started here, now we need to update because, because we have authors who are not you know, engineers, they, 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 they're, they're authors. Um, so I, I guess it's a bit, bit tricky, I mean, how much is an Arbitex license in, in, in US? $800, $1,000, I don't yeah, know. It's pretty comparable with the other tools. FrameMaker yeah. and XMetal, uh, yeah. So, so, so if you if you're a professional user, I would rather I would rather spend two hundred dollars more and and get the right to for 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 XML authoring. Um, if I don't have any money whatsoever, uh, I, I I guess you're stuck in, in in open source projects. But they are a bit, um, you know, they they don't hold the same quality and they're the same user friendliness as as some of the other tools. That's a great answer. Um, and I always like to tell people, you know, there's more to cost than the software. And if you're going to go the open source way, make sure you put a cost to your time, energy, effort to both developing and learning, because that's a real cost too. If you're doing that, you're not doing something else. Uh, and it needs to be part of your cost analysis. So here's two different questions. Were parts catalogs part of this solution using Arbortext? Hey, that's a nice question. Um, that's a tough question even. For Electrolux, we're actually using Arbitext to produce uh, part catalog information to their web um, shop, their e-shop. E so uh, for this specific company, we've implemented a, uh, a way to import Excel sheets that comes from, from uh, development um, that then creates a, a, a you know, a parts catalog, um, and we're using IsoDraw for the images, and then it marries the IsoDraw image with the with the Excel sheet from from development, and then creates a complete catalog, and then we publish that catalog uh, in XML actually to to their their um, web shop, and then it gets published online there. Um, the the problem with Arbitext today is that Arbitext doesn't have a good infrastructure for the, the delivery of the, of the, unless we're talking PDF. So, so in Arbitext it's an excellent tool for automating and creating a PDF uh, catalog for, for parts, but they don't have a really good uh, environment for the delivery, you know, the, the, the shopping baskets, the navigation, right. Right. things like that. Uh, there used to be a product, but that, that was disclosed. So we actually had to look for a third party product on that at, at Simonsoft. But, but um, um, so, out of so, curiosity, yeah. what did you end up with? Uh, we ended up with a, a tool called Assert. Um, okay. That was a, that was uh, reasonably, you know, uh, big. It was easy for us to to integrate uh, Isodraw, and uh, I have the link in Firefox for some reason. So I'm not bringing it up. Um, it was it was. They were very, um, the good thing with them was that they understood that if you're providing a web um, solution, you can't, you can't have proprietary formats. You can't run around with, you know, flash files and, and, and things like that. Because when you're publishing a, a product catalog on, on, uh, on the web, it always, it always uh, ends up with you having to support what you're publishing. So... Right. Therefore, we, you know, these were the guys with the cleanest, let's say, um, uh, web solution. So here's here's how it looks. Interesting. Um, and also, they of course they can do a PDF, but they can't do as as nice PDFs as we can do in in Arbitex, But <laughs> you know. so this is for a company doing uh, uh, forest machinery. So, so harvesters and, and things like that. So there you go. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So, and then you have the hotspot functionality, highlighting, adding things to a basket, things like translating. It translates all the, the, the terminology and things like that. And you can have, here's a little 
advertisement page and things like that. So this is just a web view of it. Excellent. All right, we've got another one. Can you talk about more more about the translation management process? Oh, and and how long time did I have? <laughs> oh, you've got at least another half hour if you want. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, tra translation management is an interesting topic. It's it's I'd say it's the most complex pro process um, when 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 authoring in in uh, XML. And um, of course, it was one of the biggest business problems when we uh, came to Electrolux. Um, th there are a few approaches to this, but in general, what you want to do is you want to take a little more control of the translation workflow um, than in the past. And you, you don't want to trust your translation agency quite as much as you used to do. Uh, because you are paying for uh, words that you have already translated. It's very likely that you're already paying for this. And so you want to start taking control of what words are new in a document and, and what are old uh, words in, in this document. And then there's a few technologies on how to do this um, and, and, and tools. But in essence, it's all about being able to compare the file you're about to release in your master language with any data that was previously written uh, and translated. So for, I might be able to show you actually in Arbitext, uh, here we go, for this one, I could actually open up a file here, I think that, dun, dun, dun. if you allow me to browse for a minute, I can show you what they send out to the translation agency actually. Um, here we go, and there's the translation demo documents. So in the end class, I see that should be the one. Oh, well, some stuff. All right, so there's some attribute errors with the new DTD, but in essence, what they send is a file that has attributes translate no if they are already translated once. So they keep their own translation memory um, and then we send the XML file in the master language to that translation memory and it matches all the tags, tag by tag, to that memory and then sends back, if there is a translated text, it sends back the, the target language and marks tags the, 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 the section with translate no. I don't have so many translate yes because I think this was like a perfect no, perfect match on this document. Um, let me see. Uh, here's, 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 here's one you can see. Here for instance it finds duplicated text. It finds that, that the same translation that was used um, has two um, different translations. So there's, there's an anomaly here of some kind that, that you need to resolve manually for instance. But I think this was like a one-to-one -one, uh, document, so it shouldn't be any, any translate yes in it. So basically that was we do. We, we take a translation memory of some kind, we, we shoot the, the, the data to that memory and get a bilingual file back. We then send the bilingual file to the translation agency who only have to translate the, 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 the tags that are, are marked translate yes. Um, and this normally reduces the cost by, I don't know, Sometimes we up to 70, 80 percent. It's it's uh, it's crazy for, for some. You know, we're taking away the desktop publishing effort with XML. Uh, we're taking away the the, the reuse with XML. So there's not much more to to work on really. If you do, if you're using DITA, you, you're probably taking a slightly different approach, which means that each element of DITA then then gets matched. Um, has like a language brother uh, or or sister in in each language, and then you just replace that with the with the with the data file. But many of our customers are so small that they don't they don't use data for 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 authoring. Um, they they and they come from a very book like environment. So that's the reason. I, I hope that that that's very that's a very short answer, but it's a, it's a long discussion. This on how much are you paying. How, how do you control the way you work with your agency? Because the, the way you work with them could significantly improve cost and, and time as well. Um, 
who's proofreading um, your documents? Are you doing that internally or, or are they doing that? And so, so the, the big problem with this process is that somehow we need to take data out of this single source, send it somewhere else, and then get it back in. And it has to understand what happened on the outside and, and compare and things like that. So it's a, it's a tricky process. Good answer. Uh, let's see, we have a couple more. One is, how long did it take for Electrolux to become productive? That was actually very quick. Um, they started to write. They started to write a month after we we started the project. Um, whether they were productive or not, that, that's a that's a bit of a, a tough question. But I, I would say that they started to work on the new manuals only. We didn't do a migration at Electrics. I think that's important to say. So we didn't migrate all their old InDesign data. Um, so they started author for the for the new generation products, and that meant that we we had a good. It, it was very simple for them because they they could start writing, get a hold of XML, understand what they were doing, um, slowly take some pieces of the old documents, and we started to create libraries for them. So libraries of of warnings, libraries of of legal text, and things like that that they knew they were wanted, wanted to transfer. But there wasn't any urgency in publishing the data or translating the data. So when we came to the later stages of that project, uh, we had everything prepared, the, the database repository, and everything was done. And, and then we could start get working on the translation project with the, with the first translation process and so on. So I, I would say that they were productive very fast, but they choose a strategy which was very um, slow start strategy. But I, I think it served them well because in an organization with two or three people, you can't really do the, 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 the full frontal approach. Um, they do did have other work to do as well. Excellent. How, okay, so here's the another little bit of backstory. How can you talk about how Electrolux implemented the solution? Did they pick one product or do they do them all at one time? All right. So they started with the editor and the, and the publishing. So no no XML repository. So they started with with uh, basically what you see on screen, the editor, and then we built them a style sheet so that they can hit the print button and get something out of there. Um, oh, by the way, are we talking about the XML project, Liz, or or the complete or, or the or the tech talk project? You think? That's a good question. It says <laughs> solution, so uh, I probably would... probably XML project. So okay, that, that's the first thing we did for them. That that takes us. Uh, a week or two to have that done and delivered and, and, and have them trained on that. And then they start authoring. Um, so, so that wasn't really um, a, a big thing. Then, then we started to work on what attributes to have, what metadata to store, you know, how to, to store the files and things like that. And then uh, after time we implemented the, the um, uh, XML repository for them with, with libraries and, and everything. And finally, I think in the uh, one of the projects that was coming towards the end, because there wasn't much of publishing going on, the publishing we mostly implemented in the beginning for them to control the style and to, to have the preview function so they could see the document. Um, and then in the end of the process, we, we also implemented a number of, then we started to use the publishing engine functionality a little bit more so that, that they could hit the button and it could produce 28 languages in one go. It could send a web. It, we do now also a little bit of a web um, publish for them so they can take the data into the web pages and then it sends that to a disk on somewhere. So every time they publish a document, the document has to be sent to five different places and then now that, that's all automated as well for them using the, the publishing engine. Wow, that's but great. This was a low, this was a fairly low budget project. We didn't have a, all that much uh, money in it. Interesting. So here we have. Uh, I'd like to get some ideas from other industries. What other kinds of projects and other industries have you been working on recently? Oh, we are we are very in Sweden. We're very focused on 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 um, manufacturing. Um, we're moving towards software. We think is 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 a, our, our next big uh, effort going to be. We have some software customers, um, and some of the customers that are doing manufacturing are also doing software. Um, 
software industry is interesting because they have the same language problem. They have another funny issue, which is the GUI strings that the, the thing you read on screen have to match technical documentation. So it's a bit of, it's a, bit of a technical data problem there as well, if you will. It's the same, same kind of methodology. Um, they, they, they write topic-based. Every a, a programmer, the difference with the, the industry of, of software is that the programmer writes the documentation, really. Because when he programs a function, he then also authors that function. So uh, within software, they're already talking about topics, but they don't mean topics as in data. They mean help topics. And, and that fits very well into to the Arbor text, and it fits very well the fact that we're using subversion as, as, as our, our um, uh, tool for, for uh, managing data. Um, so that's an industry we're, we're seeing is, is, is growing a lot. Um, and that's also an industry that starts a lot with open source, and then they come to a point that they, they, we get even calls in, yeah, we've started this with open source, but we'd like to now have a more commercial-based uh, solution. We need to do some more stuff with it. Um, in UK, we're much more focused on publishing, as in publishing houses, you know, people writing legal texts, um, book publishers, um, training material, and things like that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the old legacy customers that the Arbitex had, basically. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, we're based in the Silicon Valley where you see lots and lots of software, so uh, it's pretty pervasive here. Good examples out here. We've got um, most recently, last month, as a matter of fact, to the user group, we heard from Dicron Precision uh, out here in the in the valley. Uh, the video was mm -hmm. should be posted today, and I'll post your, the video of this recording um, hopefully today as well. I was not at the awesome. last one. Great. We have one more thing. Interest. He, that was good. He comment. Actually, that was good. Interesting how you related documenting software to topics. Excellent. There you go. That's from the audience, not from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you did a good job. Great. All right. We'll give a couple more minutes to see if anybody else has any questions. Otherwise, we will see you all in a month for the next user the person, meeting. The, Liz, the, the yes. person who asked for the translation, the, the person who asked for translation management, uh, he or she can drop me an email and I can send a presentation with a more full scheme on, on, uh, on uh, things to think about within uh, XML. And, and, and translation management. And just if she or he, he or she just drops you an email, you can forward it to me, and, and I have some material on that. Oh, that's great. I don't know if you'd like to send us your slides and have them posted with the video. Yeah, sure. Why not? Great. We'll do that too. Excellent. You did a great presentation, and those are really good answers for from some very tough questions. <laughs> 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 so I want to thank both Peter, who is the second voice everybody heard on the phone, and Jonas for coming out, especially in their evening. It's evening time in Sweden. And I really appreciate your being part of the, the group and presenting to us today. Thank you so much. No problem, Liz. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for organizing this. It's really good. Yeah. All right. Oh, all right. The questioner said, posting the slides with the video will work for me. And it was Scott Allshouse who asked the question about translation. Ah, uh, we know Scott. <laughs> Good stuff. There you go. Excellent. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you soon either at the Monster Garage or at the next user meeting. Thanks. Bye. Take care.